Greetings, and I hope things are going well for you. Um, let's take a moment as we prepare. We're going to look at um, the last couple verses, not quite the last verses in uh, Luke chapter 24. But as we do, let's, let's pray that God just come, joins us here today, and the, and the Holy Spirit will, will speak to us through His Word, that He'd open our minds to, to what He wants to tell us in His Word today, all right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for um, the, the gift that you've given us in your word. And, and as I stop, if I ever do stop and think about it, I'm always amazed at how you have protected and you have taken care of and you have um, made sure that we have this book. Lord, that you have, you have handed it to us and uh, sometimes we don't, we don't treat it as well as we could. We don't spend as much time as we need to, and we don't recognize what it does or what it can do in our lives. I pray today as we slow down, as we just read a few verses and, and work on what's there, God, would you help us to recognize there's this conversation you're having with us? Would you help us to hear what you're saying and recognize it's you? And I pray that, that, that we'd be able to tune out all the stuff that isn't you and hear what you're saying today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let me do just a real fast review. We're in Luke chapter 24, and Jesus has been resurrected. Uh, the, the disciples that were headed to Emmaus, they had an experience or, or an encounter with Jesus, and they ran back to Jerusalem, and they're, and they're telling the people in, in the, you know, the disciples that are all gathered together. And, um, and while they're talking about it, right, Jesus shows up. And they're scared to death. They think he's a ghost, and he goes, no, 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 does a ghost have, you know, a, hand, a body and things like that. And he goes, look at my hands, touch me, look at my hands, look at my feet. And he showed them his hands and his feet. And what we looked at last time was, um, look at the extent to which Jesus goes to, to verify that he's not a ghost, that he's not a spirit, but that he's physical, he's a physical body, that he, it's really him. And, and as we look at that, what we, what we kind of worked through on that is, is, is to recognize just how much Jesus was, was wanting them to recognize or see that it was him. And, and, to, and he offered them peace. The first thing he does as he returns after the resurrection is he, is he wants to address their doubts and their fears. And he goes right forward. And if you look at that passage just before this, um, what you see is, is he addresses their doubts and their fears. And, and he offers them peace. That's the first thing he says when he shows up. Peace be with you. He doesn't say calm down. He says peace be with you. And, and do we hear that in him? Do we grab a hold of that from him? Peace be with you. He offers it to us. And the only reason we don't have peace isn't because our world's crashing around around us down around us, not because the world around us is a disaster and a mess. The only reason we do not have peace is because we have not grabbed hold of it and received it, because he offers it to us. So that's what we looked at last time, all right? So let's go ahead and continue in our reading of Luke chapter 24, and this is what Luke tells us, all right? He said to them, so he's, he's just showed them their hands, hands and his feet, they, he's offered to touch them, and, and he eat, he's eaten a piece of broiled fish, and he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. The repentance for the forgiveness of sin, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. All right, so, so as we kind of work on this little bit of a passage, I know you're probably thinking, man, is he ever going to finish uh, Luke? And, and I'm dragging it out here. We're just in the last few verses, and, and I'm cutting it short here. So just about four more verses left of, of chapter 24. But sometimes, you know, as we look at this, right, it's, it's maybe it's a good, good idea to get kind of a running start. And I kind of did it with the review, but let's take a moment and let's not forget Jesus has encouraged his disciples to verify that it was really him. This is where the conversation begins, right? Check it out. See that it's me. If they don't believe he is alive, if they think he's a ghost, then what he says next means nothing, okay? 
It's important that his disciples move past the ghost idea. So as we begin to see this passage, we need to recognize the importance that Jesus is alive. Okay? That Jesus is alive. He was raised back to life. He went from dead to life. This is what he does. This is what he did here. This is what he does in us. He brings us life. And because he is alive, we can know eternal life is possible. So now that that they have touched him, right, and now they have seen his hands and his feet and watched him eat a piece of broiled fish, he moves to this next step. And this is what he says, right? He says this. This is what I told you. Okay, This is what I told you while I was still with you. While I was still with you. Let's just, let's slow down on that one, all right? Because what really is strange to me as I read that is, is, that's an odd statement. It's been three days, right? Had, Had there ever been three days that they hadn't been with Jesus? I'm not sure. But it's almost like Jesus is talking about this huge Time span, but it's been three days. Remember way back. Remember when? Remember when I was with you, and, and I told you these things. I mean, it's almost like there's this there's this thing that's sitting in between pre crucifixion, before his arrest, right until now. There's a huge divide here that Jesus acknowledges. Now, we could just move right, right past it, and you might go not think, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, you're splitting hairs, Darren, but I want us to just think about this. He goes, while I was still with you, this is what I told you while I was still with you. I'm not sure I completely understand this divide here, but I see it kind of being addressed. He's with them now, and it's only been three days, Right? There's this three-day span that divided the pre-crucified and and resurrected Jesus from the post-crucified and resurrected Jesus. And there is something significant about those two Jesuses, right? Eh, Careful, because I'm not talking about, there's not really two Jesuses, right? But there's something in between here. There's this, there's this, 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 while I was still with you, and now. Three days is not a lot. I mean, when you're mourning and when, you're, when, when you think all hope is lost, it seems like a long time. But, I mean, we, we go on vacation longer than that, right? We don't talk like this. Well, oh yeah, remember when I was still with you? A week has gone by since we last met, right? We were together. Do I ever say, well, I was still with you, right? No, it's just, it's, it's just kind of a, this odd statement. He didn't say earlier, he didn't, say, remember, he didn't say, remember back then, but rather he said, while I was still with you. But he's with them now. Things are different now. See, Jesus is, is acknowledging, it appears to be that Jesus is saying, this is different than then, okay? That was while I was still with you. But now... Something's changed. It's still him, right? But his position is now so different that the previous three years were set apart from the now. How he is, what he is, is different than back then, than while he was still with them. Jesus is making the distinction. Those days are different than these days. A new era has begun. Think about it. From the time of Adam and Eve, right? From the time they they sinned, from that moment, right, that they ate the fruit until Jesus was standing there, sin had its way in the world. Sin had continued to destroy everything that had been created. And for that time frame, everything was on a downward spiral. Now, we don't know, we didn't know what we were missing. But the only hope was if God stepped in and changed something. 
It was on a downward spiral, but all, all of mankind, they didn't, didn't know what they were missing. But the only hope was if God stepped in. That divide is real. Those days are gone. And while none of us ever lived prior to Jesus' death, we should be able to recognize the two lives we've lived. The life before Jesus and the life after Jesus. Now, I grew up in church. I don't know a time when I didn't believe. But there's a period of my life where I wasn't following him, where I wasn't listening to him. In fact, I, I would say I was, where I was running from him. I mean, it's pretty tough to be disobedient and want to stay in disobedience and stay with him. I was running. Now, I'm not sure I realized it, but in the middle of it, but those were, those were dark days in my life. That divide is real. So they're having this conversation with Jesus, but he is different now. He is the conqueror, the war has been won, and everything has changed. As he talks about what he said before the crucifixion, before the resurrection, he's saying, while I was still with you. But now is different. Yep, he's right there with them, but it's different. They just don't know how much has changed yet. So, while I was still with you, it's a significant phrase. And he says, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. All right? First of all, just wondering, right? Why don't we do this? Let's, let's, let's go back and see what he said. All right? Yeah, he says, everything, everything that is, was written about me in the law of the prophets, uh, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, okay? I told you. I told you. So let's go. Did he tell them? Let's just find proof. Well, let's do this. Luke chapter 22, verse 37. This is right before Jesus is, is arrested. Um, it says this. It is written. Jesus is saying these words. It is written. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. He told them, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. This is what he had said to them. Here's the proof that he actually said it to them. We go to Luke 22, and this is what he said. It's written, right? It has to happen. This is what's written. He told them this. So let's go to Matthew 26, 56. It says this. This is Jesus talking again. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. What an interesting little, it's weird to take that kind of out of context, right? But it's right before he's arrested, and the, the words he says before he's arrested is, all of this has to take, had to take place. This is what was written about, right? It has to take place. Jesus is saying, listen, I told you, all of this needs to take place. Everything that's been written about me in the law and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms needs to take place. I told you that. Look, he did tell them that. Look, let's do one more example, all right? Luke 18, verses 31 through 34 says this. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem. And here it is again. Everything that is written about, by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. There's proof. There it is, right there. Jesus told them everything must be fulfilled. Everything that's written in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms needs to be fulfilled about within me. He's now reminding them that he said this has to happen. And we have proof right here. We looked at it. We have proof that he told them this. These three passages show us that he did. Now, let's keep going on that little piece of Scripture. He says, 
everything. Okay? Everything. It's important that we understand that everything, not just some of the things that were written about him, had to be fulfilled. Now, the reason I pause is because that word everything is pretty significant, all right? Now, we can say, well, not, not everything about Jesus has been fulfilled. Right? Because we know there's more to the story. Because some of the prophecies are referring to his second coming. See, they were struggling with this, right? This isn't who we thought he was going to be because this is what we expected. This is what we're looking for. This is what the Messiah is supposed to do. And we got you instead. And you're telling us everything that was written about you needed to be fulfilled. But what about this and what about this and what about this? Those prophecies haven't been fulfilled yet because he's coming back to call us home, to put an end to this world. But remember that divide I talked about? Remember while he was still with you, while I was still with you, versus now he's with them? The divide is significant because the pre crucified and resurrected Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies that were written about him. It's significant because there are two sections of prophecy about Jesus. One is the pre crucified and resurrected Jesus, the one is the post crucified and resurrected Jesus. The post resurrected Jesus is different, and those prophecies are yet to come. Now, Jesus groups these, or he talks about Scripture, these three groupings. The law of Moses, right? The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, we could dissect the, the, the prophecies and find them in one of three categories. We could go, oh, well, here's a prophecy about Jesus, and it's found in the law of Moses. Oh, here's a prophecy of Jesus, it's found in the Psalms. Oh, here's a prophecy of Jesus, it's, it's found in the prophets. But in reality, what Jesus is really saying is that there isn't a part of the Bible that doesn't speak about what is, going, what is coming. There isn't a part of the Bible, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, that doesn't speak about what is coming, about what Jesus is going to do. The Hebrew Bible was broken down into the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Psalms were also called the Wisdom Literature. Jesus was saying the whole of Hebrew Scripture has been speaking about the death and resurrection of Jesus. There isn't one part that doesn't speak about him. So, let's continue through the verse, or the passage. He says, right, what Luke tells us is, then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. Let me stop here for a moment. Something very significant happens here that's very important for all believers. Jesus does something that here the disciples were missing, right? And up until this time, they were amazed at what Jesus said. And what I mean by that is they were amazed at how he spoke with authority when, he, when it comes to the scriptures. Right? People said, well, we've never heard anybody talk like this. He brought new light to the Scripture. And we can say, well, of course he brought new light to the Scripture, right? Because he is the Word. He knows it not only in and out, he, it is him. But think about it, right? The Scripture is him. How, what does that mean? That means that, that everything that was said about him had to come true because it, it's him. And, he, and they were amazed at how he spoke with the authority. But somehow... He would use the scripture, right, in ways nobody else had ever done before. He connected things that they had never seen before. He understood them in a way that none of the teachers had ever understood them. And they would sit and listen to him and be shocked, amazed. The words of the Old Testament, for them, they were instructional and in history. But when Jesus came along, and Jesus started opening up the scriptures to them, he kept telling them that they were more than that. They were all pointing toward him. 
is at this point that Jesus gives his disciples something they were going to need in just a few moments when he ascends. He gave them something that made all the pieces come together. Like something kind of just, it's almost like something clicked in their minds and they were able to see how the scriptures spoke of Jesus. And what we need to remember is that the Bible is not just instructional in history. It's a spiritual book, okay? Written by the Holy Spirit through human beings. In fact, let, let's just, let's look at a couple examples of what Scripture, what Scripture says about Scripture, okay? So let's start with this. Uh, oh, before we do, we can approach the book as instructional, prof, instructional, prophetic, or historic and learn many things from it. But until we recognize that it is a spiritual book, we will miss the greatest value in it. The Bible is a tool for us to spend time with God. In fact, it is the most significant tool given to us to spend time with God, to know Him, and for Him to speak to us. The Bible is relational it can deepen our relationship with Jesus. It's not just history. It's not just instructions. As we read it, it's relationship. Listen to what Scripture says about it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 6. This, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in right, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Not just instruction. There is something there that it does for us and in us. Listen to this one. It says James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. It says this, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that so, it is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and, do, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who, who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. You hear it? I don't know if you do or not. It is not just a static, two-dimensional book like every other book in the world. This one has life. It interacts with us. It works on us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this, For the Word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This, it's, it's moving, it's, it's, it's not plain, it's not dead, it is alive. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6, it says, It's the helmet of truth and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's a tool. 2 Timothy 2, 15 says this, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of God, the word of truth. How do we handle it? Do we treat it like a history book, prophetic book, instructional book, or do we treat it like it is alive? That is our, our connection with God the Father. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, The person without the Spirit does not accept things that come from the Spirit of God, but consider them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerning only, they, they are discerned only through the Spirit. They are only discerned through the Spirit. The Word of God needs the Spirit connected with it. The Word of God is described in the Old Testament as a light to our path, but in the New Testament it is described as alive. This is a powerful moment. 
not only in our lives, not, excuse me, not only in the lives of the disciples, but in the lives of his disciples. Before we knew Jesus, we, can, we could read the Bible, but not really grasp it. In fact, I, I've heard so many times, I tried to read the Bible, it's just confusing, it doesn't make sense. But what we see here, this event describes what he does for us when we receive him. That he opens up our minds to the word. His word should be like something described in these passages. Alive. Teaching. Building. Correcting. Cutting. Dividing convicting, freeing. Do you hear the activity of the word? Jesus is the word of God, and because he is alive and in us, his spirit connects our spirit to his word. It resonates within us. It resonates within us. We can expect Jesus to open up our minds to understand the scripture because that's exactly what he does here. Now, I want you to listen to what Jesus tells them is written in the Scriptures, okay? But not only does he say that uh, all, everything that needs to be fulfilled that's written about me in the Scriptures, but now he says, and here's what I want you to see, right? Here's what's written in the Scriptures. That the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Okay? So somewhere in the Old Testament, it tells us that... He will suffer and rise again on the third day, specifically. Okay. Now we have a few passages that make reference to the resurrection, such as Psalm 16.10. If you want to look it up, you can. But Jesus says specifically the third day. Well, Jesus made a reference uh, about Jonah. Okay? And he says, just like Jonah, who was in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be. There, there, there is a... There's Definitely a connection between the story of Jesus and the story of Jonah, right? Because Jesus makes the connection. So we could say, oh, well, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of a prophecy. Yeah, it is. But first and foremost is the story of Jonah, right? But listen to Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. This is what we were told in Hosea chapter 6, 1 and 2. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. This is like Jesus standing there right now, right? After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us. There it is. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Well, where does it talk about the, th- the actual third day of Jesus' resurrection? Right here, Isaiah 6, chapter, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. All right? There it is. Now, this is what he said, right? This is what's written about me. On the third day, he rose rose again. It's there. And then he says, after that he says, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus makes reference here that the Old Testament prophesies that the good news will be preached all over the world, starting in Jerusalem. Now this, if you don't know it, this is kind of the the Great Commission, right? We'll talk about that in a moment. But but listen to this. Psalm 22 says this. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. That turning to the Lord is a significant image or picture, okay? That's repentance. The turning. And all the families of the nations, of all the nations, will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached through all the nations. So Psalm 22 speaks about it. Or, or maybe this one would be even better for you. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. That's walking a different path. That is, that's that's description of repentance here, right? The law will go out from the from Zion. The Lord, the word of the Lord will from 
Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, there's the nations again, and will settle disputes for many people. God makes it clear through the Old Testament that his plan is greater than just Israel. It's for all the nations. And in this little phrase, Jesus has not only opened the scriptures to them, but has placed upon his disciples a commission. To preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins as it's connected to his death and resurrection. This prophecy is still at work today. It didn't stop with the people in that room that day. It is our job because that prophecy is still being fulfilled. All the nations haven't heard yet. It started in Jerusalem. We see that it has it spread, but it's still needing to spread. That all people will hear, that it will be preached everywhere, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. How does that make you feel? See, as I slow down and I think about it, right? Hey, Jesus says, hey, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached all over to all nations. There's this part of me that goes, is, is that my message? I mean, is that, is that what I'm preaching? Now, as a pastor, right, I probably read that a little bit differently. And some of you might be thinking, well, I'm not a preacher, so no, no, no. We disciples have been called to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And if you slow down a moment, it can be considered a great honor. But the question is, are you? I mean, is that your message that you're sharing? Repent, to be forgiven. Your life is a message to those around you. Does your life preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Does your life preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Well, let's, let's work on that, okay? Repentance means to turn around, to change, uh, have a change of heart and mind in regards to sin. And I used this when we talked about uh, the road to and from Emmaus. But what does your life and your habits preach? Does your life preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins? I mean, is there evidence of this in your life? Because Jesus says this is what's going to happen, right? As he tells his disciples. And, and, and we, call, we call this the Great Commission. Yes, it's worded a little bit different in, another, in other Gospels, but, but it's here. This is the same scene. Is there evidence in your life that preaches repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Here's the deal. When we create a facade that we have no issues, right? That, that, that we are perfect almost, right? That we don't have any problems. We don't preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And, and because we do this, what happens is, is people outside of the church say things like, the church is full of hypocrites. Because quite honestly, we create a facade that's not really all that great. They can still see through it. We're not that we're not that dumb. Okay? We can see through the facade. But we work really hard at putting up this facade. And when people see around the front of the, front of the facade, around that, that fakeness, all of a sudden, they go, it's not real. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins is real. When we confess our sin and turn from it, we preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. When we live it, right? When we confess and we turn away from it, when that part of us is being dealt with, then that is our life preaching repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
when we live a life that is different than the way the rest of the world lives, with attitudes, behaviors, and priorities, then our life shows that we've changed, that we've repented and received forgiveness. Does your life preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins? So let's go ahead and let's, let's stop on our, on our kind of our study of the passages, all right? And let's come back to this question. So what do we see in here that kind of addresses or talks about his formation in us, right? And, and what I see is this. Jesus does something for the disciples here that they were unable to do for themselves. And that should be a clue right there, okay? When Jesus does something in us that we do not have the ability to do on our own, that is a transformation in us. That is Him doing something in us. And so what we see is, right, Jesus does something for the disciples that they were not able to do on their own. And when He does this, what what happens is, is they take on the characteristic of Jesus. When he opened their minds to what the scripture said. We can sit there and and read over and over what the Bible says. But until he opens our minds to what the Bible says. We're like the disciples who weren't getting it before this. But when he opens our minds, right, we take on the characteristic of Jesus. See, Jesus, and the reason I say that is because Jesus understood the Scripture. Right, He understood it better than anybody else. And he imparted that to them. Before Christ lived in us, we could read Scripture, but the experience was without help from Jesus. As we're reading the Bible, we're trying to grasp it, we're trying to understand it. You go to read the Bible because you're looking for answers, right? You're searching for something. But kind of like the disciples before Jesus opened up the Scriptures to them, they didn't understand it either. Jesus spoke and they were amazed, right? They were like, oh my goodness, right? Have you ever thought how blessed we are that we have been given His Spirit that directs us, that speaks to us, that helps us understand the Scriptures. And even helps us understand the world we live in right now. Because this is what's happening. As as we see it in the scene, he opened up their minds to the Scriptures. And what that did was, it not only helped them understand what the Bible said, right, what the Hebrew Scripture said, but what it did is it helped them understand what was going on in the world around them. Everything was run through that filter then. They could see what was going on differently from that point forward. This is what He can do in us. This is what He wants to do in us. It's not something we can create. It's not something that that we can muscle our way to. It's a transformation that He does what we cannot do ourselves. This scene shows us a piece of the transformation that Jesus can make in us. Because he's alive. He's in us. He's transforming us. And rather than on the outside nudging and influencing, right? Transformation only happens from the inside out. Not from the outside in. Transformation happens because he is in us. Transforming us from the inside. Helping us understand his word from the inside. That his spirit resonates with what the scriptures say. Will, we will be his witnesses, is what Jesus says. That is the description of his transformation of us. We will be his witnesses. Will we let him transform us? Will we stop and listen to what he says as we read the scriptures? He's given it to us. Our piece of the puzzle is we need to read the scriptures. We need to slow down and to listen. 
He's given it to us. Now will we let Him transform us so that we preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins? That we will be His witnesses. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, I pray that as we, as we, as we just let this kind of soak in the, the passage, we see this, this change, this transformation that, that, that you're constantly kind of shining light on, that you're, you're telling us you want to do in us. And Lord Jesus, I think I, I hear a lot and I, and, I, and I think this often is, well, you know, I just got so far to go. I'm only human, or, you know, well, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm, ne- I'm never going to be perfect. And, and Lord, I pray that we stop having that conversation. And we just let you change us. May we use what you've given. Would you tra- allow us to be transformed? And I pray for us. Lord, I would love it if we were past all of the selfishness and sin in our lives. Some of us aren't very far along in that road. Some of us are frustrated even in that process. But would you remind us that our life is a testimony? and preaches repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so would you help us to continue to confess our sins to you, repent, and turn from sin. Would you change our priorities and our attitudes and our actions so that our life preaches repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I pray that you have a wonderful week this week. And may the Lord continue to work on you. Spend some time in His Word. Let Him open up your mind to what it says. Have a wonderful day.